Thank you so much. It is a great honor to be able to speak to you all. I hope to be able to visit Estonia at some point. Um, this is as close as we can get under current circumstances and uh, the privilege is mine. I'm going to give a title to these remarks and the word is FEAST, F-E-A-S-T, and it is an acronym and I'm going to explain its relationship to behavior change and decades of work on improving public policy, improving health outcomes, and spurring economic growth and helping the most disadvantaged members of society. Uh, in particular, these remarks will come in four parts. I'm going to begin by discussing findings from behavioral science and behavioral economics and the notion of nudge as an instrument for behavior change. Then I'm going to explain the mystery, what is the FEAST acronym referring to. Then I'm going to draw some lessons from vaccine hesitancy. And I'm going to do that because the area of vaccine hesitancy has been well studied and it has important implications for behavior change quite generally. And I'm hoping that will be clear. And fourth, I'm going to introduce a new concept, sludge, which refers to frictions or administrative burdens with the suggestion that nations, both private and public institutions, should be engaging in sludge audits, that is assessing the magnitude of sludge with the understanding that when we audit our sludge, we often discover we have much more than we want and removal of sludge often can be a uh, ex an extremely effective way to produce change in behavior. So those are the four parts. I do have a prologue. This is not a book. This is a set of remarks, but these remarks have a prologue. And the prologue consists of examples of, of change that has benefited from behavioral science. Uh, the first of my examples comes from Denmark, and it's very recent. It's an announcement today, which is a new app which makes it easy to become an organ donor, has substantially increased the number of people who are organ donors in Denmark. That was just announced today. It's a new online app. There is a social change question, how can we increase the number of organ donors, making it easy through an app has had a surprisingly large effect. The second example comes from my own country, the United States. We had a challenge a number of years ago, which is that poor children are eligible for school meals in this country, free school meals, lunch and breakfast, but a number of them don't sign up. How can we change that? What we did was to say that if we know you're poor, you are automatically enrolled in the program you don't have to sign up. And as of recent uh, studies, 15 million, 15 million poor children are benefiting from this program. It has been a small step that produced a large change. In Germany and Switzerland, there has been, of course, keen interest in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and many strategies are at work in both of those nations. There is an instrument that's been used in Germany and Switzerland, which is automatically to enroll people in green energy. They can opt out if they don't want to be in green energy. In Switzerland, at least, green energy is a little more expensive. The evidence suggests that automatic enrollment in green energy has produced a spectacular increase in use of green energy and a spectacular decrease in use of uh, environmentally less friendly uh, energy sources. In Switzerland in particular, very recent evidence shows that not only households, but also small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses are staying with green energy, even though it's more expensive and even though it's very easy for them to switch to gray. That is evidence of a substantial effect of a nudge. In a country, I will confess it is my country, we have had a challenge with 
consumers using credit cards in a way that is less than perfectly prudent, where they have incurred late fees and overuse fees, which cost consumers the equivalent of billions of euros in unnecessary expense, especially people who don't have a lot of money have not managed their credit cards as well as they might. We did a nudge, which is to give people more information about the consequences of not paying their credit cards on time or of overusing their credit cards. And we engaged in some regulatory interventions to try to counteract reckless or insufficiently informed behavior. The evidence suggests that this has saved consumers somewhere in excess of 8 billion euros annually, just as a result of behaviorally informed strategies. Okay, these are examples of change produced by an understanding of behavioral findings. Now let me go from the prologue to what we might call chapter one, which is behavioral findings and nudging. We know from decades of research that human beings are not irrational. That is an unkind thing to say, as well as a false thing to say. But human beings are imperfect choosers. This relates to economic choices, and it certainly relates to the environment. In particular, we know the following. Human beings often show what is called present bias, which means that they focus on today and tomorrow. But the future is a foreign country, later land, and they're not sure they're ever going to visit. If people focus on today and tomorrow, but not the future, it may be their own health or their own economic situation will be at risk. People who smoke cigarettes show present bias. People who use alcohol too much show present bias. People who don't eat healthy show present bias. And it also endangers the environment when it's believed that the consequence of a decision today will have an impact only in some distant future. Present bias can be a serious problem. We know as well that human beings suffer or benefit from inertia. People sometimes procrastinate. If they are engaged in a certain kind of behavior, to change it to something else is often painful and takes effort, and people will need a very strong motivation or a very easy path to engage in change, which is one reason that habits with respect to all sorts of things tend to endure. We know third, and this is in many ways a good thing, that human beings tend to be optimistic. It's a mixed blessing that human beings tend to be unrealistically optimistic. Uh, most smokers are aware in some nations of the statistical risks of smoking, but they believe that they personally are less at risk of lung cancer and heart disease than the average non-smoker. In some studies, 90% of drivers believe that they are better than the average driver and less likely to be involved in a serious accident. It appears that something like 100% of people believe that their sense of humor is better than the average sense of humor. And data suggests that over 90% of professors believe that they are better than the average professor. Unrealistic optimism can create serious problems with respect to any number of things. And when it's combined with present bias, the challenge for behavior change can be very, very serious. We know, and this is the last one I'm going to give, that human beings have uh, shown loss aversion. A loss from the status quo is very troubling. Often, it makes people sad or scared. A gain from the status quo is good. It makes people happy and relaxed. But a gain is less good than a loss is bad. That's a clue about successful behavior change strategies. It suggests that if people think something is a loss from the status quo, they're more likely to respond often. So if people know they will save money if they do something, they might change. If people learn that if they don't do something, they will lose money, change is more likely. And indeed, some nations have used loss aversion for change purposes. 
for example, by having a small fee for use of a plastic bag at a convenience store, a bonus for bringing your own bag has no effect. A fee for asking to use plastic bag at a convenience store has a very significant effect in changing behavior. And the best account is that loss aversion is the reason. If we put together present bias, inertia, unrealistic optimism, and loss aversion, we'll have some understanding of obstacles to behavior change and some clues about what might help. Nudges are interventions that preserve freedom of choice but steer people in particular directions. A GPS device is a defining example of a nudge. It's a nudge in two senses. First, it's you who get to decide your preferred destination. If you want to go to Paris, it's your choice. If you want to go to Rome, it's your choice. Second, the GPS device gives you clarity on how you can get where you want to go. That's the respect in which it's nudging you, and it's a bit paternalistic. It is telling you how to get where you want to go. There are two kinds of nudges for behavior change purposes. Some involve architecture and some involve education. In the examples with which I started, we are talking about architectural interventions. If children are automatically enrolled in free school meal programs, or if customers are automatically enrolled in green energy, that is an architectural solution. If consumers are informed about the economic consequences, let's say, of one or another choice, if they're given calorie labels, or if they're given information about the environmental impact of automobiles, that is an educative intervention. If people are reminded that they have a doctor's appointment or that they have a fee due, that is a nudge. It preserves freedom of choice. They can say, well, I don't want to go to that doctor's appointment. So far, there's no mandate. Denmark's app, which makes it easy for people to register as organ donors, that is a nudge. It preserves freedom of choice. It is not educative. It is an architectural intervention, that that nudge. We know from data that architectural interventions tend on average to have a greater impact but educative interventions can have an impact too. And sometimes citizens or customers prefer a warning, a reminder, a calorie label to something that is more architectural. Okay, that's the end of that part of these remarks on behavioral findings and nudging. Now let's turn to the FEAST framework, which is my largest organizing theme. What I'm going to do here is borrow from the EAST framework, which is very much at work in Europe, and add the word F to it. And I'm going to explain at the end, I'm not going to spoil the surprise, what research the word F is building on. What's useful about the EAST framework is despite its simplicity and with gratitude for your indulgence, not only for my barbaric American accent, but also for my use of acute acronym. It does summarize uh, a great deal of uh, scientific research on behavior change. The E in the FEAST framework stands for easy. And the basic idea is if we want behavior to be changed, the best thing we can do is make it simple for people to do the thing we want them to do. There's research from a German psychologist named Kurt Lewin many, many decades ago which found that if you want to change behavior, your normal intuition, everyone's normal intuition, is how do we push people to do something that it's good for them to do? What the German psychologist said is that that's often wrong. Often what we ought to do is think, why aren't they doing it anyway? And remove the obstacle. The notion is that often the best strategy for behavior change is to find out why people aren't currently doing the relevant thing and take the obstacle away. That's a brilliant idea, and it helps explain why automaticity and simplification 
are often the best paths towards successful behavior change. If we make inertia favor the new behavior, then the chances are we will get a very substantial increase in the relevant behavior. And in Germany and Switzerland, with respect to the use of green energy, and in the United States, with respect to use of free school meals for poor children, that's exactly what has happened. Automaticity is often the best friend of behavior change. If you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that, you can simplify things. So to take away paperwork requirements and administrative burdens, or to increase the take up of programs in Estonia or Germany or Mexico or Colombia, nations which have focused in one or another respect of late, I understand on all of these issues, if you simplify the requirements, you can often have a big impact. The A in the FEAST framework stands for attractive. And here the basic idea is if you make something catch the eye or colorful or beautiful, you can often have much greater impact than if you do something that is bland or ugly. In New Zealand, some of the strategies for combating COVID-19 have used attractiveness to good effect. They have used colors and vividness in a way that is spirited and energetic rather than using scientific data or numbers or fear, attractiveness is often effective. The S in the FEAST framework probably wins the Olympic silver medal with the E winning the gold medal. The S in the FEAST framework stands for social. And the basic idea here, which a lot of data supports, is that human beings are profoundly affected by what other human beings are doing. And if people learn that most people are engaging in certain behavior and their behavior is unusual or an outlier, they are likely on average to shift in the direction of what most people are doing. This is true among young people, it's true among, among middle-aged people, and it's true among old people as well. In one European nation, there was an effort to get doctors not to prescribe so many antibiotics in order to decrease antibiotic resistance. And the strategy that worked was to inform the doctors who were prescribing an unusual number of antibiotics of precisely that, that they were in the upper percentile of antibiotic prescribers. The result was to reduce in a short period the number of prescriptions of antibiotics by over 60,000 in a relatively short period of time, just because doctors learned that they were outliers and they didn't want to be. If we publicize an existing social norm, whether it involves smoking or saving or whatever, that often is an impactful intervention. Now, I just described research that we have a lot of data on going back for decades. There's new data, which I find particularly exciting, which finds that if you inform people that there is new or emerging behavior in a certain direction, not that the majority is doing X, but people are increasingly doing X, that can have a very large impact. The reason appears to be that if people learn that most people, that people are increasingly doing something, that gives them a sense it's possible, it can be done, and it also gives them a sense that the tide of history is in a particular direction, and people don't want to be on the wrong side of history. The T in the FEAST framework stands for timely. And here the basic idea is if you want behavior to change, you should focus very closely on exactly when information is most useful. If you remind people of something the day before, that's a good idea. If you remind them 10 days before, that's not likely to be useful. If you tell people about something economically important at the time that they are about to make the relevant decision, that can be extremely effective. If you tell them in university, that might not work. They might forget. That's the EAST framework, easy, attractive, social, and timely. It suggests has a number of lessons for 
effective behavior change interventions. Now I'm going to tell you the solution to the mystery. The F for the FEAST framework, a new idea, is fun. And the idea is that for behavior change often, we focus, that is policymakers and academics, often focus on data, on fear, on absorption of something that might make people unhappy or terrified. The F in the FEAST framework suggests it's often more effective to make the good path pleasing or produce a smile or some laughter. In New Zealand, with respect to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, there was early an intuitive understanding of this point with the prime minister saying, we're going to have a lockdown. It's going to be hard. But the Easter Bunny and the Truth Fairy are going to get exemptions. The Easter Bunny is not going to be in lockdown. And much of the work in some nations in responding to the pandemic has had a sense of delight, improbably, amidst very difficult circumstances. Of course, not only delight, but occasional delight, because under difficult circumstances where behavior change is sought, human beings need to smile and laugh. In one country, there's an idea of humor over rumor. And this is based on evidence, which suggests if you want to encourage behavior change with respect to food consumption, for example, for people to learn that eating more vegetables is healthy, is effective, for people to learn that eating more vegetables is delicious because the veg vegetables really taste good, that can be more effective. Some soft drink companies have used this strategy to good effect in trying to encourage use of diet drinks, suggesting not you're going to gain less weight, but instead you're going to enjoy the drink more. And many companies have used this behavioral finding to try to produce behavior change in an environmentally preferred direction, not only by suggesting that people will be better citizens, but also they will enjoy the activity or the product more. Okay, let's shift from that to the final part of these remarks which involve, um, uh, well, the next to final, which involve um, uh, that lessons from vaccine hesitancy, and then we'll talk about SLUD. So I've worked with the World Health Organization now for a number of months on behavior change in the context of health generally. And for vaccine hesitancy, we know three things that are very simple, and they have large implications. The first is when people don't get vaccinated, it's often because it's inconvenient to get vaccinated. That maps on directly to the E in the FEAST framework, which suggests we need an enabling environment for vaccine uptake. And that has implications for all sorts of behavior change. If people find getting vaccinated to be simple, short in the sense it's not time consuming, kind in the sense that the people are treat those who are getting vaccinated with generosity, pleasant and not confusing, then they're more likely to get vaccinated. My, my dog is approving of that uh, practice. Uh, second, we know that vaccine hesitancy is often spurred by a sense of complacency where people don't change their behavior because they think the status quo is fine and they're not particularly at risk. There are ways to address complacency that are social by suggesting that the life one saves might be that of one's parent or one's uncle or one's best friend's grandparent. The S in the East framework suggests social obligation as well as social norm and a sense of how to meet a social obligation can often be uh, enlisted in the interest of overcoming vaccine hesitancy. That also has general lessons. Third, we know that a source of vaccine hesitancy is distrust. If you think that the vaccine is going to hurt you and not help you, that it's about profits and not about uh, life-saving, then you won't get vaccinated. And many people who are hesitant are especially mistrustful of the vaccine.
This also maps on to behavior of many kinds. And the best way to address that might be to find nudgers who have particular credibility among that particular group. Sometimes the word used is surprising validators. That is people who can validate a proposition or support a cause of action course of action who are not anticipated to be supportive of that course of action, those people can be effective nudgers because they aren't easily dismissed. The lessons here of greater convenience, using social norms to overcome complacency, using surprising or trusted validators to overcome uh, mistrust, those generalize. Okay, here, as promised, is the last uh, uh, chapter of the remarks, and it involves sludge. Sludge consists of frictions, administrative burdens, barriers of various sorts that can make it harder for people to get job training, for people to do the environmentally preferred thing, for people to get economic benefits to which they're entitled, for people to get a license, a permit, or an educational opportunity, for people to get access to something that might change their lives. In the United States, the take-up rate for many important benefit programs is between 40 and 60 percent. Pause over that, if you would. It means that programs that can change people's lives aren't being given access, in part because behavior is profoundly responsive to the magnitude of sludge in the system. In the United States, we know that according to the latest number, the number of hours of paperwork burdens imposed by the federal government is 11 billion. 11 billion hours in paperwork burdens. It would be very good to know what is the corresponding number in Estonia Chances are that whatever number there is for paperwork burdens imposed by the government, it's higher than it should be, and it is a profound obstacle to behavior change. One reason it's a profound obstacle to behavior change is that even if people are perfectly rational, they might conclude that the burden, the administrative burden, is just too high to navigate, and so they will give up. If people are human rather than perfectly rational and suffer from inertia and present bias, they might give up all the more. I want to add one additional problem for sludge as an obstacle to behavior change, and that is what I think is the most exciting research in behavioral science in the last eight years or so. And the research shows that each of us suffers from scarcity of the, in, in our mind not just scarcity of money, but scarcity of attention, that what we can devote to any enterprise is less than 100% because we're thinking of other things. And if we are busy or poor or lonely or hungry, the problem of scarcity is especially severe. If we're trying to get people to change their behavior and they are poor or busy, or in some sort of stress for one or another reason. The fact that attention is limited and scarce is a, a big obstacle. And that suggests that sludge will be like a wall often between human beings and some sort of behavior change. I'm hoping that those of you who are listening are thinking of examples of sludge as an obstacle to behavior change in domains which no one has thought of yet, this is a work in progress. The United Nations is getting focused in general in connection with the sustainable development goals on the sludge problem. There are two things you can do in the presence of sludge. The first is measure it, and the second is reduce it. We need sludge audits all over the world. A sludge audit has been conducted in a nation, uh, um, I, I won't name it because it's underway, right? It's ongoing right now. That's going to measure how much sludge there is. A small institution can do an informal sludge audit just by asking people how much time do they spend on administrative tasks 
or how much time do citizens spend on administrative tasks in a two-week period? Sludge reduction often is a terrific instrument for behavior change, and it often frees people up for other sorts of activities as well as freeing people up to engage in the behavior change in question. Uh, you're hearing, by the way, the administrator of USAID in the background, that's my wife, who has two big jobs. One, she runs USAID. The other is she is a mother to my two children who are maybe in need of some behavior change right now. And I hope she's using some of the strategies we just described to get them to do it. Sludge reduction is often an urgent task for behavior change, and it's more subtle than it appears. I am done with my remarks. I thank you for your patience. I'm going to end with one question, which is what is the, and it's an effort to unify these remarks, what is the one thing that is most precious for our species, for human beings? What is the one thing that we are luckiest and most blessed to have? That question has many good answers. I suggest that in 2021, in the aftermath of uh, a terrible set of events, uh, the best candidate answer is indeed a four letter word. And the word is time. Let's find, shall we, ways to give our fellow citizens, citizens of the world, more of that? Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, this was both inspiration, inspirational and uh, highly optimistic. When listening to you, everything seems possible. I need, we, we, we definitely need uh, optimism. And um, yeah, it's kind of uh, refreshing to think that uh, perhaps uh, clever nudges could substitute a lot of our today's regulations. So we would need less of it. Um, we've got uh, quite a lot of questions uh, from the audience, and uh, I would like to start with the one that, uh, is it likely that in case the tools of behavioral uh, economics are used more often and more wide, the effectiveness will become lower as people will be more aware of the mechanisms and, um, uh, and intentions of these tools? It's a great question. So... So let's distinguish among different kinds of nudges. Uh, so if people are automatically enrolled in a program, let's say it's a savings program or a program that helps poor people get access to benefits, the use of that ought not to reduce its effectiveness. In fact, there's evidence in Sweden that when people are automatically enrolled in certain savings program, it, programs that basically last forever. It's also the case that as people become aware, let's say, that a cafeteria has been designed so as to promote healthy eating, or a healthcare program has been, de been devised so as to promote certain kinds of choices, that knowledge of the design will increase its effectiveness because it uses not only architecture now, but also education. So if you learn that the healthcare program has been devised because you are, let's say, in your 70s, and this is particularly suited to you, you're more likely to stick with it than if you weren't informed of that. So some behavioral strategies become more impactful as people understand them better. At my university, Harvard, there's a little nudge that tells us things about when the uh, cafeteria is most likely to be busy. It's a nudge to go in times where the lines aren't so long. And, and the fact that we know that we are being nudged to go at times when the lines aren't so long, that makes it more effective, not less effective. It is true that some strategies that involve disclosure of information might become less effective over time as people are less focused on it. They consider it something like background noise or furniture. And so for those, we need to know what is the data showing. There's some concern that uh, graphic warnings designed to get people not to smoke so much or not to smoke at all might become less effective over time as the initial uh, sense of 
you know, horror at the graphic warning recedes, it becomes just like what you see when you see a cigarette package. Okay. Yeah, people might get used to it. But I absolutely uh, get your point that uh, if people understand that the nudge is there for taking better care of themselves, so they might uh, appreciate it. Uh, but uh, things might be different as well. Another question is that um, mm -hmm. uh, when you brought out this example just in the beginning uh, about the free school meals that is, that, that is provided when we know that the person is poor, how do you recommend that we re reduce the stigma with letting the government know about the personal financial situation? Many people might be too proud to admit needing assistance. Well, that's, that's a great point. So what we don't know is why before this nudge, this behavior change, the use of free school meals wasn't higher. We don't know why that was. It might be just what, what the question suggests, that people didn't want to admit that they were poor. It might be that they were busy and to sign up would be uh, trouble. It might be they were scared. They thought if they signed up, they'd either disclose something they didn't want to know or get in trouble with somebody. That, that's true. In, for this particular program, the uh, authorities actually know who's poor, either because of some other program in which they're enrolled or because they know their taxes. But automatic enrollment in something that has eligibility requirements might not be a great idea if it involves access to private information that people rightly deserve to have private. And if that's so, then simplification is preferable to automatic enrollment, where you make it easy for people. You don't just assume based on what you know that they're, that they're in. Okay, so there are many options and uh, uh, yeah, it depends on the circumstances. Questions uh, have, uh, have come also about uh, how do you know which kind of behavior is good or right and how do you balance uh, nudging in a democracy so that people would not view it as another form of um, control or propaganda? Okay, great. So on the second question, uh, it, it, it's good to be very specific, I think. So if there's a policy that says that credit card companies must disclose to people relevant information about late fees or overuse fees, it's hard to see that as propaganda. This is a disclosure strategy designed to ensure consumers are informed. If when people buy tickets for uh, airline flights or on railroads, all fees have to be disclosed up front so people aren't surprised by certain add-ons. It's hard to see that as propaganda. If people are automatically enrolled, let's say, in a savings program, as Denmark has done, the United Kingdom has done, uh, that would be hard to describe as propaganda. Uh, it would be very good to make sure if the program is one that's deemed to be rightly uh, uh, optional, that people can opt out if they don't like it. And so opt in and opt out are two alternatives. If the option is you're automatically enrolled and you can opt out, people ought to be given clarity and simplicity about how they can opt out. So uh, the question is, what, what would be propaganda? What kind of nudge would be propaganda? Uh, I think it would be hard to describe propaganda in its worst form as a nudge. We describe it as prop propaganda. In terms of what would be a, a good way to nudge people, that, that's something for all of us to discuss. Um, one idea is under circumstances of pandemic for people to be nudged at least, maybe more, to wear masks. That, that's a good idea. And if masks are mandatory under very bad circumstances, then nudges can help make the mandate effective. For environmental matters, if we think that, let's say, fuel-efficient cars or energy-efficient uh, appliances are less expensive so that consumers will save over the lifetime of the product, then if we know that, then we know that consumers should be nudged to do that because they'll save money. Whether or not we know that, if we know that it's environmentally very important for people to or nations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then 
we might want to nudge them to do exactly that. We might want to do more than nudge. We might want to have a fuel efficiency mandate. Uh, I mentioned the United Nations in part because there's a lot of exciting work being done there and in part because it's relevant to the question. The United Nations is exploring the relationship between nudging and sustainable development goals. And those seem to have consensus approval at the World Health Organization where I've, uh, I'm a technical advisor. Uh, there are questions about health hazards that young people face and we're just releasing a report about behavioral science and health risks that young people face. Now we, we don't want to put young people, my 12 year old, my nine year old are in the next room. We don't want to put them under you know the most severe imaginable constraints, but to nudge young people not to engage in unhealthy behavior, uh, that's that's probably a good idea. Yeah, I mean, trust the common sense would be perhaps uh, one of the uh, one of the conclusions uh, of this. Uh, another question: If we know how human behavior works and we know it for a long time already, then why do we still have too few nudging in place? It's also a great question. I would say that the modern era of understanding of behavioral science really started in the 1970s with some work on how human beings depart from perfect rationality that tried to show that our departures are predictable. Uh, one example is present bias, another is unrealistic optimism. Of course, there is diversity among people in how present bias they are. Some people aren't present biased. They're not a lot of fun, those people, by the way, but they might be very healthy and have a lot of money. Uh, we also know that uh, people often don't assess risk, risk very well. From 1970 to now is not that much time. So we've had over 50 years a great deal of research. We know much less than we should and much less than we will in 20 years. Knowledge keeps uh, growing. Um, the work that tried to bring this work on behavioral science to bear on policy and law, it's, it's younger even than 50 years, probably started around 2005. And the first serious government work on uses of behavioral science and nudging probably started about four years later uh, in various nations, uh, particularly in Europe and North America. And now we're talking about not a lot more than 10 years of experience. There, there is a great deal of work happening. Australia has been doing tremendous work. There's excellent work in New Zealand, the United Kingdom, the United Arab Emirates now has a nudge unit of a kind, so does Qatar. Um, the United States and Canada, we've seen a great deal. Uh, in Finland, there's some excellent work being done. In Denmark and Germany, the list is very long. Recent work in Italy and Japan, there's a new nudge unit. Um, so we're seeing a lot. In the next 10 years, we're going to see much more. Absolutely great to hear that. Uh, what are the areas of life where the, uh, the tools of behavioral sciences are underused at the moment? Where is the biggest potential? It's also a great question, and uh, we probably want to go nation by nation. Uh, uh, across the world, for poverty reduction, we've seen much less than, than we should. So given the toll that poverty takes on so many people uh, to have a dedicated effort to use what we know about behavioral science that would involve uh, that could produce that would produce big advances and it's it's happening public health is a, a second um, and i don't want to rank it below poverty i want to put it with poverty the number of uh, preventable deaths in every nation is far too high one example that isn't particularly glamorous is road safety, where Sweden has a vision zero, which has used behavioral techniques to uh, try to reduce deaths on the highways. And it's been extremely effective. Many nations should be borrowing from the uh, vision zero idea. Uh, um, uh, I'd, I'd love to know the data in 
Estonia with respect to road accidents, uh, to take a list of preventable deaths, whether it involves smoking or obesity or uh, something else, alcoholism, and to use behavioral strategies there. That's the public health dimension. And of course, environmental protection is, is another one. Uh, the world is engaged on climate change. Can I tell, I'll tell you a little story I, I, uh, which tells you about public health and climate change and how they're interestingly intertwined. Uh, in, I worked in the Obama administration for, for four years, and I had colleagues who worked for eight. And I asked one of the most important American negotiators in the Paris uh, discussions why China was so uh, willing to be engaged when China hadn't been before. And the answer was it was public pressure. And the, the China isn't a democracy, but the public in China, the government, uh, knows what the public thinks, and the public wanted more environmental protection. And I said, what's that? What, why was that? And the answer was it, there are apps on phones that measure air pollution in China. And the citizens could tell it was terribly polluted in Beijing and elsewhere. And that was producing illness. And, and I said, you know, but that's not climate change. That's about uh, standard air pollutants that are making people sick. And he said, you don't understand. He said that the strategies that reduce uh, cl cl greenhouse gas emissions also reduce other forms of air pollution. And so the Chinese government in Paris was willing to engage much more than previously because the public said, reduce air pollution. And the greenhouse gas reducing strategies reduced air pollution generally. And that is, I think, a powerful story of a nudge, which is information about air pollution, producing a demand for air pollution reduction strategies, which ended up including greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a clue, I think, about how the world can make progress and is making progress on the greenhouse gas crisis just by virtue of public information about adverse effects. I think it's good to conclude with this very encouraging example. Thank you for this and thank you for pointing all these areas that can be covered with, with, with clever, clever nudges. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope Estonia still has time to join the, to join the club. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. appreciate your time and effort uh, uh, to be here with us today. And uh, yeah, as you saw, uh, there was uh, such a vivid interest uh, in the topic uh, among our audience. Thank you once again and wish you all the best uh, with your work and, uh, and with the family as well, that we had such great uh, interventions uh, in between. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great honor, and I hope to we'll visit you someday. You should. Thank you so much. Yes, and uh, yeah, have a great day. And to you.